Floyd's algorithm is a straightforward enough algorithm to use. Each of the individual steps are very simple, but there are quite a few of them. You need to be very careful in terms of making sure that you are doing everything correctly, that you are comparing the correct pairs of numbers, and that you are following the route carefully through as well. The first thing that we need to do is to create a distance table. All we need to do is have rows and columns for each of the vertices, and I've indicated a dash for each of the vertices to themselves, as in the distance from A to A is not of relevance. We don't worry about it. We're not going to bother to put zero. We simply put a dash to indicate that we don't want to travel from A to A. Then we go through looking at each of the arcs and putting the appropriate distances on. We're going to have the rows headed by A, B, C and D be the from side and the columns are going to be two. So the first entry that is blank in the row headed by A is from A to B. As we notice in the graph, we can't go from A to B via one arc, so we state that its distance is infinite. What we mean by infinite in this case is simply that it can't be done using one arc. To go from A to C is a distance 23. To go from A to D is a distance of 7. And to go from A to E is a distance of 12. In our next cell, now we're talking about going from B to A. So this one is OK. We can get there in just 8. We have a directed arc, and so we need to reflect that in the table. All of the rest of the values in the table are now given. Notice there are a few other infinite values in there. For example, C to D, we can see that there is no arc going from C to D, and so its distance is infinite. We then create a root table. Now in the first stage, this is very simple. Our first column we have all as A's, second all as B's, and so on. We're now ready to start. So for our first iteration, all we're going to do first of all is make a copy of our distance table. Again with those dashes, we're not going to use any of those cells, A to A, B to B, and so on. We copy the row and column headed by A. Just take all of those values, and we shade that row and column. Now if you're doing this on paper, it may be tempting not to shade them, but it does help you to make sure that you're keeping all of your notes in check. Uh, you might want to put a, a circle around them or something like that, just so that you're indicating that that row and that column are different. They are going to be operating differently in this first iteration. So I do advise making some kind of mark to show that they're different. Similarly, we create a root table. And because we're not going to be making any changes to the row and column headed by A, we can copy those straight away from the existing table. And also, because each of those dashes for B to B, C to C, and so on, we're not going to be looking at those. So we can just copy those straight in as well. We're now in the position where we only have 12 cells in each table which are blank. And these are the ones that we're going to seek to fill. So the way this works, we're going to go one cell at a time, and we're going to start with this cell, going from B to C. Now what we do each time is we look at the corresponding cell in the table that we already have, that's this one, which has a value of 6. We need to compare that value to the sum of the two cells that are headed by shaded columns and rows. That is, one's in the A column and row, the 23 and the 8. 23 plus 8 is 31. That's bigger than 6, and so we just put 6 back in that place. We're looking for the smallest each time. We are going to complete the root table at the same time. So it corresponds to this cell from B to C is just a C. And because we made no change to the distance table, we make no change in the root table. So we simply copy the C across as well. For our next cell, the corresponding part in the original root table is a 10. Compare 10 to 7 plus 8, 7 plus 8 is 15, which is bigger than 10, and so the 10 just goes back in that place again. No change in the cell in the uh, distance table, so no change in the root table as well. We copy the D across. And the last one on this row, from B to E, is a 5. 5 is smaller than 
8 plus 12. So the 5 goes in the cell, and similarly E gets copied across. So, so far, no change is necessary. When we come to look at the next one, we have a 6 from C to B, which is smaller than 23 plus an infinite distance. So a 6 goes in that place. And once again, the B gets moved across. On the next cell, however, we're comparing an infinite distance with 23 plus 7. Obviously, 23 plus 7 is smaller, making 30. So that is the value that goes into that cell. We do not cross the infinite across. Now, this cell, which was a D, the root was going through D at that point, we make a change. We do not copy the D across. Instead, we take the vertex that is in the shaded cells. That is, we currently have the A cells being shaded, the row and column, and so we put an A in that place. We're changing the root as we go. We've made a change for a quicker way of getting from C to D, and so we're saying we can get there quicker going via A. For our next cell, again, we have an infinite amount, which is definitely larger than 23 plus 12, 35, so that value goes in. The E does not get copied across because we made a change to our table, so instead, once again, we put A in. Our next value, we're comparing 10 with 7 plus infinite. 10 is obviously smaller, no change, so B goes in. Our next one, we have an infinite amount, which is obviously smaller than 7 plus 23. So 30 gets inserted, and again we don't put C in, we put A because we're in our first iteration. The last one on this row, 4 is definitely smaller than 7 plus 12. 4 goes in, and no change to the E. Next row, 5 is smaller than 12 plus infinite. 5 goes in, no change to B. Our next cell, infinite is definitely bigger than 12 plus 23. So 35 gets put in. Once again, we've made a change. And so A gets inserted. And our last cell, infinite is definitely bigger than 12 plus 7. So 19 goes in. And we've made a change again. And that's the first iteration complete. We need to complete five iterations. So what we do next is we're going to take that table as it is and we're going to work with that one. For our second iteration, what we're going to do is take our tables again. Now we're going to copy the B rows and columns. They are going to get shaded. We're going to be working with those from now. We can copy the root table for the B rows and columns. And again, we can copy the leading diagonal. A to A goes via A. That's all fine. Once again, we've got 12 cells to look at. Our first value, we're looking at the 23, and we compare with the row and column that matches up with that cell. 23 is smaller than infinite plus 6, so we just have 23. No change for our root. Our next cell, we're comparing 7 with infinite plus 10. So obviously the 7 goes in, and our D gets put back in again. Lastly on this row, 12 gets compared to infinite plus 5, and so we put 12 in, and E gets copied across. Going down to our C row, we're comparing 23 with 8 plus 6. Well, 23 is bigger than 8 plus 6, so 14 is going in. We have made a change, so the cell now takes the entry of B. B is our shaded row and column, and so we're putting a B in that place. Now we're comparing 30 with 10 and 6. 16 is obviously smaller, so that goes in, and we're making a change. So this cell becomes a B. I'm not going to go through every single cell in as much detail, but make sure that you can follow what's happening for the remainder. 11 is smaller than 35, so there's a change. 7 stays the same. 30 is bigger than 10 plus 6, so there's a change. 4 is smaller than 10 plus 5, no change. 12 is smaller than 8 plus 5, no change. 
35 is bigger than 5 plus 6, there is a change. And 15 is smaller than 19, so there is a change. We've got three more iterations to go. What I would recommend at this stage is that you pause the video, work through the third iteration yourself when you've got your answer, carry on with the video and see if you get the same answer as me for the third iteration. So this is our initial state for the third iteration. We've shaded the C, row and columns. We've got our 12 cells that we're going to work on and I'm going to go through this reasonably quickly. 29 is smaller than infinite, so there is a change. 7 is smaller, no change. 12 is smaller, no change. 8 is smaller, no change. 10 is smaller, no change. 5 is smaller, no change. 7 is smaller, no change. 10 is smaller, no change. 4 is smaller, no change. 12 is smaller, no change. 5 is smaller, no change. 15 is smaller, no change. So in this particular table, there was only one change necessary. On to the fourth iteration. We shade our D rows and columns, and we're ready to go. Again, I won't go through every single part. Feel free to have a go yourself and then compare to make sure you've got the same answer as me. We have a change in this place, so that changes to D. And then continuing, I will only mention when there is a change. There is a change here. The 12 has changed to an 11, 7 plus 4. So that changes to a D. So only two changes in the fourth iteration. Again, we'll do the fifth iteration, the last one. I would recommend pausing the video, having a go yourself, and seeing if you get the same answer as me. So our initial state for the fifth iteration is there, with the shaded row and column for E this time. Again, I will only speak when there is a change. For our first one, there is a change. 16, 11 plus 5, is smaller than 17. So this time we're changing the root to E. 22 is smaller than 23. So we have another change to E. Nine is smaller than 10. Five, four plus five, is smaller than 10. So there's a change. And 15 is smaller than 16. So there is a change. And this is the final state of Floyd's algorithm. On the next slide, we're going to have a look at how we use this. So here are the tables in their completed state after five iterations of Floyd's algorithm. What the tables are telling us is how to travel from one vertex to another via the minimum possible distance. So to show you how this works, I've got three examples to share with you. First of all, we're going to travel from D to A. So we look in our first table, the distance table, and we go from D to A. We can see the distance is 7. Well, without looking at the graph, we can look at the table to find out what the shortest distance is. We look at the graph, it should be pretty obvious how we're going to get there, but we need to know how to do it from the table. So what we do is we look on this table going from D to A, we look at the corresponding cell and we see it's A. And as long as it is one of the two vertices which is mentioned in the row or column, the D or the A, that's absolutely fine. That means we can travel straight from D to A. So our route is simply DA, as we expected it to be. To travel from C to A, we can look from C to A and get our distance of 14. Now how are we going to get there? Well, we're going to look at C in our root table, A in our root table, so from C to A, but now we notice it says B. So this tells us that our route is not simply straight from C to A, but we can go a different way. So at the moment, our route is from C to B to A. Now we need to check this to make sure that that is the entirety of the route. Yes, you could just look on the graph. However, with a very complicated graph, we need to have a definite method to do it. So we're going to look at this route a little bit differently. We know we've got to go from C to B to A. The question is, how do we get from C to B and how do we get from B to A? Well, we just look in the table. So C to B is via B because that's one of those two letters. That's OK. We can go straight from C to B and B to A is via A 
So that's OK as well. It's one of those two letters. C to B to A is our final route. A more complicated example, though, is going from A to C. So A to C, we can do in a distance of 22. Now looking at the graph, it's not immediately obvious which way to go, so we do need to use our tables. We're going to go from A to C, and it tells us we've got to go via E. So our route at the moment is A, E, C. How do we get from A to E? Well, it's via D. So our route has changed. We're now going A, D, E, C. We need to check how do we get from A to D. Well, that's via D, so that's OK. Straight from A to D, there's our route. We need to check D to E. That's via E. That's OK. And we need to check how we go from E to C. Well, that's via B, so our route has changed. We now need to go A, D, E, B, C. We've already checked A to D and D to E. We don't need to worry about those again. But we do need to now check how do we go from E to B. That's via B. That's all OK. And B to C is via C. So our final route, A, D, E, B, C, is how we're going to go from A to C in that minimum distance of 22. Now, when you've got a complicated route like that, I would always recommend having a little bit of a look on your graph and just checking that it works. Add up each of the lengths as you're going along from A to D to E to B to C, making sure you get that distance. And of course, making sure you're not traveling the wrong way down a directed arc. So Floyd's algorithm, hopefully you can see it's relatively simple to use. It's just you have to do it quite a lot. Be very careful with making sure that you are using the correct notation, that you are looking at the correct values, and that you're taking everything very carefully and not trying to rush it too much. Other than that, though, good luck with using Floyd's algorithm.